so i'll start with the first question um, there are few which were asked during the class but uh, i mean this is just like confirmation uh, okay. so basically the first question is uh, are green beetles selling species yeah uh, that's a great observation uh, yes you often see green beetles perched on uh, good vantage points and are scanning the area for insects and they uh, swoop down to catch bees and other insects that are flying about yes they are great examples of saline species okay and uh, this question might have been answered why during the course of the lecture but i'll still ask it off i mean apart from drongos what are the other common common sentinel species right um so drongos largely mostly drongos are seen uh, seem to be sentinel species in um in mid species flocks that we commonly see here in the western parts of india um in other flocking systems there are other um tanagers for example in the new tropics that are sentinel species um even in um even among the intraspecifically gregarious species some individuals tend to be sentinels right so for example if you've seen flocks of jungle babblers there will often be a single individual that will uh, choose a higher vantage point and scan the area so even groups of intraspecifically gregarious species are known to have sentinels within them um other species that are saline species like um parrots i catch up monarchs they are also they also have similar feeding habit except these are largely understory birds they are known to make alarm calls you will see them um giving out alarm calls every now and then but um they do not perch higher up like the drongos and they are of course not as bold as the drongos but they are saline species uh, also they may not always act as sentinel so yeah inter specifically gregarious species also have sentinels um and drongos and uh, there are few other examples like i said in the neotropics the tanagers are sentinel species all right and uh, the other question is the next question is is um if there is a, a sex specific differentiation between a sentinel in mixed flock like is there a particular male or a male or a female bird of a particular species that act as sentinel right that's an interesting one um as far as i know this has not been looked into so especially this is especially difficult to study in species where there is very little dimorphism right and uh, in drongos at least it's not diff- it's not very easy to tell apart male and females just visually um i do not know whether there is a sex specific bias in what acts as a sentinel and what what does not it might be an interesting study thank you priti uh, so the next question is um, uh so basically the question is asking uh, why do the specifically gregarious species lead like what is the reason behind them leading the group um mm. yeah yeah i'm trying to read the question why do these inter specifically gregarious species lead what is the reason uh, as they are in a group do they also give cover to the flock to move safely okay um so inter specifically gregarious species are social species that are also um like i said they may also be in their own family groups um as far as to why they lead one can only speculate if you want to answer why questions you may have to do experimental manipulation um but um but in the specifically gregarious species generally uh when they are seen to um, sort of cross over uh a particular patch or a particular open patch or a particular stream or a path you do see them going back and forth okay the some birds will fly um, across the across the street uh, sorry across the stream and then come back and then some more will pass so we don't know whether they give cover to the flock but uh, they do seem to be found in the forefront of the flock um why they do that is a question that i don't think has a very clear answer yet there could be several uh, several reasons so um if the species are um family group then um then the and they are cooperatively breeding then there may be some kin benefit to um, that particular behavior and as a result of 
um, as a result of that particular sort of evolutionary uh, hangover, the, those benefits are also reaped, or reaped by the species that are following them. So um, that could be one, one reason why they seem to be in the leadership position. So there is some amount of cooperation in the family group itself, which is then benefit, which then benefits the rest of the species that also follow them, which is probably what makes great candidates to be a uh, leader species. And that's also related to another behavior of gregarious species, which is uh, early alarm calling. So if you look at cooperatively breeding birds, they are known to have really well-developed alarm calling systems. So in specifically gregarious species, um, because they are cooperatively breeders, tend to be alarm callers, so early alarm callers. And that also makes them great uh, as flock leaders. Okay. So the next, uh, so Krishna is asking for more elaboration on nuclear species characteristics. Okay, uh, sure. So um, don't, um, I would say that don't get too caught up in the terminology uh, of nuclear species itself. Um, but um, what people have, I will still go ahead and describe to you what people have described as nuclear species. Uh, nuclear species tend to be those that are uh, important in flock initiation um, and they're also important in making sure that the flock stays together and they're also important in what we have we are calling leadership right what they um, flock moves together the species are followed by um, in just specifically gregarious species or nuclear species are followed by other species these are um, these tend to be species that are more conspicuous uh, in terms of numbers, um, that they will be several in numbers and will be easy to detect. They may act as cues for mixed species flocks. So if there is some activity there, um, you may be able to guess that there is a mixed flock there and my curious birds might go and check out uh, that particular mixed flock if they want to join or not. Um, they also tend to be noisy. They tend to make more alarm vocalizations. They tend to make contact calls as well. Uh, contact calls are calls that species make to just, they're, they're sort of like check-in calls, right? All okay kind of calls. Um, you, you may have seen jungle babbler groups if you uh, go bird watching often that there is a lot of calling, um, like chup chup calls that species make to stay in. Mm. It, it seems it, people have described contact calls as all okay calls, right? So um, nuclear species also tend to be have these interesting contact calls. Um, they, in some cases, have been described as also being um, behaviorally conspicuous. So they are so fidgety and they're so flitty um, that other species tend to follow them. And also because they then tend to flush out so many insects. So all of these in combination, you can see now already clearly that there's no one single definition of mutuality. Right? There's no uh, one particular line of definition that I can say that you know this clearly defines a nuclear species. So there are several different factors that play into this, and uh, which is what makes it really difficult to define. And I then, because of that, I refrain from using uh, the term nuclear so often in the talk, except for that one slide, because you're very likely to encounter it everywhere in the literature. Um, and hence, I call them some species that are important in flocks, so one of them being sentinel or saline species, the others being specifically gregarious species. But it's a combination of all of these factors that make species nuclear. Thank you, Priti. Um, so the next is, again, an elaboration on the phrase that you use, copying locations. Okay. Uh, well, by copying location, I mainly mean that if, if a particular individual has discovered food, I might be able to go and um, um, take advantage of that. So it's food that's already found. So you can go and copy that foraging location and benefit from. You don't have to do your own searching. Or your searching effort is then considerably reduced. That's what I meant by copying. All right. Uh, so um, Krishna is asking, um, uh, probably she's asking what uh, I mean. What flushed insects are, and do birds eat only specific insects while the others are flushed? So she wants an example as well. Okay, uh, what I meant by flushed insects is that insects that are disturbed by the movement of other birds. Um, if you have observed a 
I don't know what um, group of maybe babblers feeding. They often turn to t- um, twist, turn leaf litter. They are very um, they are very active. Um, that may lead to insects being flushed up or being stirred up from the ground, from the canopy, from the leaves in the trees, and so on. That's what I meant by flushed insects. They're not a particular kind of insects, but they are insects that are disturbed by activities of other birds. Um, that's what I meant by flushed insects. Um, those birds eat only specific insects, and others are flushed. So um, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by this question, but flushed insects are uh, eaten by birds that will uh, sally. So if um, there are there's a drongo that is following a, a bunch of um, wobblers, then these birds, uh, the insects that get disturbed by their activity, uh, is often uh, eaten by. Uh, are caught by the drongo and um, specificity about what insects get eaten is um, it's a little bit challenging to study uh, so i don't think there's been very specific uh, work on what insects some of these birds are um, eating okay um, I hope that's clear. yeah so the next question is kind of uh, interesting <laughs> See, are, are leaders the leading the flock or are they just being followed by other yeah, birds? Excellent. Yeah, that is a great, <laughs> that is a great question. Yeah, leaders may be leaders because they're being followed, right? There are, the others are not, uh, they're, they're not necessarily leading the flock, but the others are staying behind those. So yeah, both are possibilities. Um, I You would have to do some experimental work to be able to answer this. Uh, but if you look at uh, some of the flocking literature, you see that definition of leaders are such that they lead or are followed. So people have used both uh, to describe leader species. All right. Uh, I think part. I, think I also um, saw. Sorry, I also saw Umesh join in. Uh, so in case Umesh wants to, are you there, Umesh? I think he's he, he's there for the four o'clock session. Okay. Now okay. you both answer the question. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, so, uh, yeah. Sorry, uh, as he was not added as a co-host, so I just made him the call. <laughs> okay. I was just saying that uh, if Umesh has also studied mixed species flocks, and if he has anything to contribute to some of these answers, please feel free to uh, pitch in Umesh. Okay. So moving on to the next question, Parth is asking, uh, what benefits do the intra-specifically gregarious species get from joining the um, flock? Right. So um, that's a good question. Um, if we are talking about them largely as birds that are leading and the other birds are benefiting, then what are gregarious species getting from being in the flock themselves, right? So some of the protection benefits and some of the foraging benefits are common to all species that participate in flocks, right? So um, the improved protection from predators is a benefit that all species get. So the gregarious species are also benefiting from increased group size of the group um, if there are other bird species that join the flocks. If there's an overall improvement in foraging in food finding, the intraspecifically gregarious species are also benefiting from that overall uh, increased um, increased food foraging efficiency in flocks. Okay, so Krishna is asking if there are uh, more than one canopy species in mixed species flock uh, flocks, and if there are, then are they competing? And how is it that they're able to coexist? Um, right. An example. Right. Yeah, um, great question. Yes, there are often more than one canopy species or often more than one species that feed in one particular forest strata in mixed species flocks. Um, for example, you'll see ashidrongos and minivets that largely forage in the canopy. And um, they coexist yeah they sure do coexist uh, and how uh, do they then coexist is the question um, they have slightly different feeding habits first of all insects are a dispersed resource right they're not a clumped resource like you would imagine of fruiting tree to be or a flowering bush to be and uh, insects in in a tropical context insects are also a fairly abundant resource um, Secondly, uh, an ashidrongo and a minivet are both canopy species, but they forage differently. 
while uh, a drongo may be a sally is a saline species that catches insects mostly while sailing mid air uh, minivets are species that are sally gleaners that uh, sally out but also tend to pick insects um, off of surfaces of leaves so there's a little bit of partitioning there right that's what i was trying to uh, say talk about towards the end of my lecture that you may be similar in certain aspects which is here that you're using the same strata of the canopy but you're different in other aspects here the example was that they're different in foraging technique that they use or the foraging maneuver that they use when catching an insect um that is how they're able to coexist okay um so uh next to us like uh, would a flock of uh, common and pied minas or a flock of chestnut tail starlings and rosy starlings be called a mixed species flock right so sure they they are multiple species and they are moving together so you would think that it is a mixed species flock right so uh, in the classical sense in what we were talking about these forest birds feeding in mixed species flocks uh, maybe the minas and the starlings don't typically fit uh, that definition but that's not to say that they are not more than two species um here when i was defining or what when i was talking about what a mixed species flock is uh we spoke about a few different things right these are moving groups of forest birds insectivorous birds mostly passerine birds that are feeding together that are moving together that stay together for a given amount of time that uh, that navigate the forest and stay in the canopy and understory um while food finding by foraging so that would be a typical uh, forest birds flock a flock of myna starlings um we would have to look at what the context is are they external stimulus is there an external stimulus is there an external um resource that has attracted these starlings and minas to uh, to that particular area that you are looking at uh, or are these only groups that are flying about right you often see starling groups that take off and that you also see starling rosy starling murmurations uh, which everybody has seen so those contexts are slightly different uh, from what we were talking about today i'm not saying that those are not mixed groups but they are not like the groups that we were speaking about in today's lecture okay uh, so aditi was asking how uh, or basically asking you to elaborate on the mate choice as a benefit of mixed species flock oh no yeah aditi sorry if that was confusing and i did not say that mate choice was a benefit of mixed species flock i was talking about groups in general and that lets which are uh, aggregations of uh, of females sorry i'm sorry uh, of males of the same species which congregate in a particular area and females come to these lets uh, for uh, you know these to to check out these displaying males that was the mating context that i was talking about uh, it was not in the context of mixed species flocks so there was this question about lecture being available later i think it will be it was recorded so yeah that should answer that question and the next is uh, uh huh, um, but, uh, are, are these flocks randomly formed or uh, uh, are there specific individuals that regularly come together for foraging for right thanks uh, that's a great question uh, so um i'm not exactly sure what you mean by randomly formed but i do understand the later part of your question which i think explains uh, the question better so there are uh, studies that have been done on banded birds where you know individual identities of birds and it has been seen that um, these studies have been done in australia and some birds on in australia on some birds there have been studies from the neotropics as well on banded individuals and uh, you are right in guessing that there are uh, the same individuals that come together and associate with each other in mixed flocks in these areas um uh, time i mean day after day and stay together for a long time one thing that i forgot to mention uh, during the course of the lecture was also that some neotropical flocks are also permanent flocks uh, in the sense that they associate for really long durations throughout the day they are almost together all the time and flocks also hold territories so mixed flocks um, they are in a particular area they stay together they roost in um, areas that are not too far from where the flock was foraging and um, then come back the next morning so yeah species do uh, or individuals do tend to associate with 
the same individuals uh, day after day. But having said that, um, in India, there are no studies on tagged individuals, individuals that have uh, where we've been able to identify um, the the identity of an individual bird. Um, but if you do go uh, to, if you are doing field work in um, some parts of India, you may see that if you visit a particular part of the forest time after time after time, you are likely to, to see flocks that have similar compositions at the same spot, which makes you wonder whether they are the same birds. But there will have to be um, ta studies on tagged individuals to be able to say anything certainly about that. In other parts of the world, there is more evidence that same species, uh, same individuals associate. Again. Okay. So, Sulochna is asking, uh, since drongos and woodpeckers forage, uh, forage um, without being a part of a flock also, so is there a trigger? Like, is it when other species are nearby that they join or uh, recreate themselves into the flock? Mm. Yeah, um, that's, a, um, that's a good observation that it's not to say that woodpeckers and drongos don't forage outside the flock. Uh, typically, you will see uh, flocks being formed in uh, in sort of late uh, in the morning. So you avoid early morning hours when um, the flocks are still forming. So you, you won't see flocking activity so much early on during the day. As the day progresses um, and the sun comes up, the, they get slightly hotter, you'll see flocking activity beginning. Uh, as for specific triggers, I'm not aware of um, anything really specific that triggers flocking. It could be that um, you know, you the bird overhear a particular group of feeding, or there's there's a sudden vocalization activity which which stimulates sort of flocking behavior. But I don't think there has been any study on what triggers flocking. There have been playback experiments that of the kind that I described during the course of my talk on um, on certain species, so like the babbler drongo playback that I described. So such vocalizations do tend to attract other species. So perhaps vocalizations may play an important role in initiation of flocks. But you're right that you do see drongos forage by themselves, you do see woodpeckers forage by themselves. Um, yeah, but I'm not aware of specific triggers. Umesh, do you have something to add to this? Okay. Yeah, I think. Okay, so we'll move on to the next question. So um, Parth is asking if uh, I don't know if it's a hypothesis, but many ice hy many ice hypothesis and early warning hypothesis are are they two separate mechanisms or sh should they be like merged together as one? Hmm. Mm, that's interesting to think about, like theoretically to think about. So yeah, many eyes would lead to early detection. Is I think what he's trying to see. Uh, yeah, perhaps you could think of it as related to each other, but there may be some, so many eyes also just means that there are more eyes looking out for predators and early warning could also come from specific species that are good at detecting pred predators, which uh, for example, the drongo uh, or some other saline species, which are better at detecting. So early warning doesn't necessarily have to come from, doesn't have to follow from many eyes, but you're right that it may. Uh, follow from many eyes. That's an interesting point. Thanks. Okay, I, I think uh, Chandrasekharan is trying to uh, ask for an example of obligate flock forages in India, probably, or somewhere else. Right. right. So um, it's it's a little bit hard to say. Uh, give specific examples of obligate flock foragers, but there are some species that are always followed. So. In, in winters, like for example, um, I went in the place that I studied in Anshi, um, in northern Karnataka. I used to try and find birds that are um, interspecifically gregarious species that are uh, that forage uh, by themselves, that are in single species groups. But what I found was that they are always, always followed by something else. It was very difficult to find single species groups in, um, in, in particularly in that season. Maybe there are other seasons, um, and I studied largely in winter, starting November to about March, April. There are maybe other seasons where uh, birds have, you know, uh, other foraging strategies. 
but in the winters you almost always see gregarious species being uh, being followed all right um so the the next question is how do the flocks ensure that they stay together how do they ensure that flocks stay together yeah that's a difficult question to answer but there are several different characteristics that probably lead to the flocks staying together uh well vocalization could be one of those um species being uh, or individuals being present in large numbers could be another um species being able to detect and follow other species um could be another so all of these these factors perhaps act in um in you know coincide with each other to be able to um, make sure that the flock stays together interesting so um do the nucleus species communicate with other species and form a flock i mean right so the nucleus species do tend to be vocal um i can see that people are uh, catching on with nucleus species and their characteristics and traits uh, which is why i was um, giving sort of disclaimers about the use of the terminology nucleus species uh, but uh, nucleus species tend to be very vocal and uh, they do have um, well developed alarm calling systems like i was saying because they are a family groups of their own so there may be some kin related dynamic going on there um but whether they form a flock um is is something that is questionable right they are vocalizing and there is some amount of public information that is generated from the vocalization of these species and other species are attracted to this vocalization so do nuclear species vocalize and communicate yes uh, they generate public information in the process and it is possible that other species are attracted towards this uh these vocalizations okay i'm not sure if this question has already been answered i'll still ask away sure. um um the intra specifically gregarious species in a flock um what are the benefits uh, as they i mean when they lead the flock and how are these benefits different from the other species in the, within the flock right i think some a part of this was covered when as uh, uh answering the question related to what benefits do intra specifically gregarious species get but i'm trying to read this question again what are the benefits associated with gregarious species in the flock as they lead the flock how do how these benefits differ from other species okay so i think i actually may be asking what benefits do gregarious species provide and how are they different from other species so um kadri like i was saying gregarious species are known to be uh, flock leaders they are found in the front of the flock um they also tend to be often um, species that are very active and that uh, tend to flush out other insects that uh, tend to disturb other insects which um, may be caught by the species that are following and um, these benefits may not uh, they are also known to vocalize and alarm call uh, so they these benef these benefits are not exclusive or they are not extremely different but um, but they but not all so for example from saline species or sentinel species there are, there are very specific benefits it's mainly protection benefits whereas whereas with gregarious species you see both protection and foraging benefits that other species may get okay and uh, akshita is asking for uh, <laughs> more papers but uh, okay. I mean, uh, apart from the ones that are already shared could you like give a sure. easier way to i yeah i can i can share a list of species uh, sorry list of i'm saying species papers with uh, um with the npten group with jobin and devika perhaps and um they can send it to you okay so okay this next question um first of all first question is basically the is there a carrying capacity within a flock for competing species like is there mm. like a limit to the number of individuals mm. the right. other question is uh ah uh, so if the forage foraging technique is different is different species with the same technique of foraging don't come okay Yeah, can't. No, no. I'm sorry. I was reading the question. It's slightly. Yeah. Okay. So basically, what Krishna is trying to ask is, uh, would a species with the same technique of foraging, uh, are they able to form? Um, are they able to form uh, like be a part within a within the same flock? Like, do the species have to have different foraging? Same, different techniques. Yeah. Right. 
uh, yeah, interesting. So um, about carrying capacity, uh, that is an interesting question. You see a range of flock sizes, like I described, uh, in in, and there's a range of like there's a lot of variation in what sizes of flocks you see. And a carrying capacity would be with respect to the environment, right? It could be uh, it would be with respect to a limited resource. Here it is difficult to evaluate what resource we are talking about or what the limits of the resource that we are talking about are. So it's difficult to define a carrying capacity of a flock. Now, having said that, uh, like I described, in the Western Ghats, we've seen up to 20 to 25 species participate in flocks, and it's rare to see more than that. Um, that could also depend on the species pool itself. So how um, the community, how species the community of birds in that area is itself. So uh, yeah, I think the question about carrying capacity is slightly more tricky. In the neotropics, where the pool of species, or even in Northeast India for that matter, where the pool of species itself is so diverse, you will see higher species numbers that participate in flocks. So it may have something to do more with uh, the pool of species rather than uh, the carrying capacity. So um, yeah, that is one point. Uh, you do see birds that use the same foraging technique in flocks. Um, and like I was saying before, insects are a more dispersed resource. So it's not that conflict incidences don't arise. They do. Um, there may be some conflict for the same insects sometimes here and there. Uh, there may be some chases in flocks. But largely, it seems like um, an association that works. Uh, you will see two species that have the same foraging technique participate in flocks at the same time. Then they may separate by canopy strata, or they may be... Uh, one may be eating slightly larger insects than the other. So there may be subtle differences and it's hard to say every single time, uh, but it's important to think about it carefully. Uh, even if they're using the same foraging technique, what is it that is different about these two species? Okay, this next question. Is not always, sorry, I'm just finished. It may not always be different. Yeah. So this next question is quite interesting. I mean, uh, are there freeloaders in a par? I mean, they basically wouldn't have any advantage to the flock, but they're still there, a part of a flock. So are there? Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, excellent. So uh, yeah, definitely. I think uh, that there is. It is very likely that species don't contribute actively to um, the benefits in the flock. That is an interesting question, um, but. Um, there are things like, for example, uh, species, when it joins the flock, by default, it's increasing the, the group size of the flock, right? It's contributing to the group size of the flock. Um, so that way, it's contributing to the dilution effect. But uh, it may so be that the species does not contribute so much with respect to food finding or with respect to uh, disturbing insects, which become available to other birds. And the bird, however, on the other hand, the bird itself is that individual itself is um, uh, is kind of benefiting from um, these feeding related benefits itself. So, yeah, there can, there can be free flocks. Mm, okay. So, um, Anand Gopal is asking if uh, there are some changes in the vocalization of birds when they are within a mixed species flock? Um, oh, that's a very, very interesting question. Uh, it has not been studied so much vocalization, changes in vocalization in flocks and outside of flocks. Uh, in fact, there is a student who is interested and is studying some vocal behavior in, uh, in general, actually vocal behavior in mixed flocks is very understudied. Um, so we would love to understand more uh, about how vocalizations are different in flocks. Um, but yeah, it's a question that's largely not been answered so far. Okay, the next question is probably, um, uh, I mean, contributing to the question already been asked. So, mm -hmm. um, MJ Singh is trying to say if uh, many eyes hypothesis could actually many eyes could also contribute to more successful foraging. Hence, can it be an independently stated mechanism? Many eyes could be contributed to successful. Like independent as in from the early warning hypothesis. Right. We did. I, I mean, I think I said, stated it as an independent uh, mechanism. Yes. Uh, but you're right that many eyes could also contribute to successful foraging. Many eyes also contributes to uh, 
detection of predators so it's related to two different things like more more individuals searching for insects more individuals watching out for predators and uh, then early warning is separate from this yeah you're right yeah. i think uh, they're trying to answer the question that was asked earlier yeah you're right john uh some i mean divya pal is uh, thanking you for your excellent presentation and uh, it was lucid and comprehensive thank you. so um, i think i think i'm i misread krishna's uh, question i think she has rephrased it over here uh, mm -hmm. she's asking um, do different species consciously com communicate and form a flock <laughs> yeah uh, thanks krishna i think it's difficult to say uh, what whether species are communicating consciously but uh, what i wanted to say earlier what i was trying to say earlier was that when a species vocalizes it generates information which is then used by other species so i'm still sticking with that answer i do not know whether this is a conscious it's difficult to answer these questions about whether a species is doing it consciously or not consciously uh, and is uh, starting a flock um it is Yeah, I don't know. Umesh, what what do you uh, think about species starting with flocks consciously? Well, like you say, Preeti, it's difficult to tell um, whether the species is vocalizing consciously to uh, start a flock or whether you know it's some kind of ingrained, evolutionarily selected behavior. Uh, but I think your answer is right. It's that uh, every vocalization carries some information, and uh, therefore, you know, I, I would stick with that answer too. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, a uh, very last question for you, I think, Priti. I, I don't think there are more questions after that. But uh, very similar to vocalization, are there different uh, behaviors as well uh, when the speech is within a flock and when it's not? Right. Yeah. That's also an interesting question: whether species behave differently when they are in flocks versus when they are not. And this behavior could be in terms of various things. It could be in terms of vocalization. It could be in terms of foraging strategy. And it is possible uh, that species use slightly different feeding strategies when they are outside of flocks and uh, inside the species flocks. But um, I can't, off the top of my head, think of any comparative work that has been done and demonstrated this. But it is a definitely an interesting question. Like I was saying, sometimes when you are um, especially flock researchers when they go out into the field in the peak flocking season you almost always see species in flocks so it's very difficult to record them outside of flocks but that would be make a really excellent uh, study question and if somebody was able to uh, go out into the field and collect that data it is likely um, that you'll find something very interesting yeah so mrinal is also thanking you for a great presentation and discussion which it is actually great thank thanks priti uh so okay there is next question has come sorry to you i was still wait for a while so uh, that means that also ha huh, okay so uh, basically mj is talking about uh, kleptoparasitism i think a uh, literature that brings out that drongos also steal food from other species by mimicry so doesn't that generate mistrust among other participating species towards a small bird fact uh, so towards the same bird acting as sentiments right so um mistrust is a very uh, value jud judgment related term so i wouldn't say mistrust i would refrain from using mistrust but yeah so the drongos are known to uh, steal food from mimicry and many of you may have seen um the videos that uh, david attenborough's documentary has right the drongos giving alarm calls and the meat cats are feeding um and the drongo gives out a warning and there is a predator the meat cats is is carrying a way to hide and the first time it's a true warning but then the drongo does a false alarm and then it mimics a meat cat alarm call and so on so um yeah drongos are seen to do such interesting behaviors in uh, different systems um and uh, it is about uh, really how many times um, the the target species loses uh the the food that it is it has captured right so there is of course a trade off between what benefit a uh, species gets from the drongo alarm calls versus how much cost it pays in terms of uh, the loss of food and if um the drongo alarm calls calls are so important uh, crucial to the survival of that particular individual then it's a sort of 
versus life kind of a dilemma, right? Uh, you would let go of lunch for to save your own life. So it's uh, it's an interesting dilemma to think about. Um, it's definitely a trade-off that species probably think, uh, you know, in some ways have an understanding of, um, yeah, I, I don't know if I've completely answered that question. <laughs> I think a lot of thank yous coming, I think, for you to read in the chat. So uh, I'll move to Umesh's question. Umesh, uh, would that be OK? Sure, Jobin, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, there was one question that came. Uh, there are actually two questions, uh, same person. Uh, so. Okay, so I'll read out the question. I haven't read the question, but so my doubt was about the question regarding hornbills feeding off of 35 fruit trees in the absence of the competitor species. Uh, does eco ecological relief indicate both population increase and niche, ex niche expansion due to absence of competitor? Or, uh, and will niche expansion feeding from more trees always result in increased population size? Um, sorry, Umesh, do you want me to? Uh, I'll just copy this question on the chat box so that. Yes, could you copy that question into the chat box for me, please? So, uh, about character displacement. Uh, uh, sorry, Umesh, just one thing the assignment is still open and uh, the deadline is not passed yet. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> just want to. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so I'm not going to uh, reveal anything about the assignment question, <laughs> but uh, about the character displacement. Uh, you know, it's not uh, uh, it's not necessarily only to do with morphology. For example, it's not necessarily that it's only beak size that changes or only body size that changes in the presence and the absence of a competitor. It could actually be uh, um, uh, you know changes in behavior. For example, if you have a, a certain species foraging only in the understory of uh, a forest when there is a competitor in the canopy. And then when you remove uh, the uh, competitor species from the canopy, you have uh, this uh, other species expanding its range from the understory to the canopy as well. So, you know, even foraging behaviors like that can change in response to the presence or the absence of a competitor species. Um, so this, okay, so this is assignment seven, which apparently had been closed yesterday. I don't know what this question is. I... No, no, it's not a, sorry, it's not a question. I think I think you've answered the question that's supposed to be answered. Okay, okay. Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll, yeah, sorry. You want to say something? Sorry. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. I'll take the okay. next question. Yeah. So um, the next question is from um, the 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 discussion forum. Um, okay. So the person is trying to ask how accurately can we age a bird once it has attained adult plumage. Uh, for it depends on which kinds of species you're talking about. Oh, once it's uh, uh, retained, once it's got adult plumage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the hand, it's very, very difficult to uh, judge what the age of a bird is. For all passerine species, it's actually impossible to do uh, just by looking at the bird in the hand when it's uh, it's an adult plumage. So you don't know whether it's two one year old or two years old or six years old. Uh, there are ways to do this uh, through molecular techniques. You know, if you get a blood sample, then, you know, people have looked at the length of chromosomes, uh, length of what are called uh, telomeres in the chromosomes. Uh, and that's been used to, uh, uh, to uh, figure out the age of species. But in the hand, it's, it's, it's near impossible once a species has uh, got adult uh, plumage. Okay, so the next question is from your PPT, where you were, I think it was, the slide was called estimating abundance um, through mark recapture. So the question is, um, there was a, uh, there were numbers over there. So in this case, the 36 is an estimation and 40 is the actual population. Like it's a question, question mark. Basically. Yes, 36 is the estimate of uh, the population size. The actual population size, which we actually don't know, right? We, we don't know what the actual population size is. We're trying to estimate that size. So the actual population size in nature, which we don't know, is is in this case 40. So this is a, sort of a contrived example. So you know, it's, we know that uh, 
we know that there are 40 individuals uh, in that uh, habitat. Uh, and uh, if, if you have satisfied all the assumptions of the market capture model and so on, then the estimate that you get of population size will be very close to the actual true population size. And I didn't go over this uh, in the presentation itself, but you also get an estimate of standard error. You know, you, you get an estimate of uh, the confidence that you have in your estimated population size. So you might get, for example, uh, the mean estimated population size is 36. The range uh, of population, est uh, population estimate could be from 32 to 40. So you'll also get sort of a, a band of, you know, it's 95% likely that uh, the population size is between 32 and 40. All right. Uh, so Tahir is asking if um, is speciation happening by competition or because of competition? Is speciation happening by competition? Is speciation happening by competition? It's in chat box. Yeah, yeah these are the words. Uh, so, yeah, that's Tahir Ahmed's question. So, so there are several forms of speciation. Um, speciation by competition. Usually what happens is that uh, uh, you know that there is this principle of competitive exclusion uh, which is very very uh, foundational in ecology which states that two species that have exactly the same niche are uh, uh, cannot coexist. One will drive the other extinct. Um, so two species that are perfect competitors theory predicts that one of them is going to win uh, and is going to drive the other one to extinction but species that do compete with each other you know you you, you do see uh, things like the ghost of competition past where uh, you see patterns let's say in foraging behavior where you have an ancestral species that then splits up into uh, multiple species, but usually the cause of that is, uh, you know, isolation, what's called vicariance. But I think there will be a session on speciation uh, and Robin uh, will talk about, you know, biogeography and there might be more insights about uh, the role of competition in speciation uh, when that session happens. All right. I think uh, the next question is, uh, I mean, um, I think it's related to your uh, spot mapping um, uh, slide. So uh, I see that I see that in the, is that one in the chat box. Yeah, 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 the one in the chat box. So uh, the question is: Is call count specific to some birds, as the other counts are not possible, or is there any other way to count? What is the accuracy of the count based on the fact that all the birds might not call when we are counting, and how do we identify same bird or different birds calling? If only male birds call, then how do we make out make the count inclusive of females? Uh, right, that's that's uh, that's a great question, and it actually shows. Uh, some of the limitations of call counts, right? So, we, for example, if you have, uh, if you want to estimate the uh, abundance of francolins in the breeding season, and you know that these francolins are going to be calling, uh, and you and they're going to have territories in the habitat, so you can actually identify from where each male is calling, and you know that you know this is one male in this location, that's another male in another location. You know, if you know all of this and you know that you're not confusing two males, then you can say the estimate of the population size with uh, uh, of males in this location is so and so. Uh, but of course, you don't know how many females are there. So it's true that, you know, the, uh, the spot mapping uh, technique is not suited generally for estimating bird population sizes. Uh, it's... Uh, very, very specific cases uh, where you know a lot about the biology of the species and you know which which individual, you know, are males calling, are females calling and so on and so forth. Uh, that spot mapping is uh, useful as a technique. Okay. Uh, I think uh, the bird in your last slide, someone wants to know the idea of that bird. Uh, I think it was... Uh... That can be answered later. Uh, 
So the next question is, what's the actual difference between exploitation and interference competition? Uh, and yeah, do the comp right. uh, both of so, these. Yeah. So the difference between exploitation and interference competition, you are absolutely right that both will directly, both will decrease the fitness of the organism. But the uh, the difference between the two is the mechanism through which uh, the competition acts. So interference competition is where there is a direct interaction between two competitor species. So I could, uh, if I am species A and you are species B, then as competitors, I could actually chase you away from a resource. So for example, if I'm for, I'm a hornbill, a large species foraging in a fig tree and a bunch of, uh, you know, green pigeons comes in to forage on the same figs, then I can directly, as, as a larger bodied species, I can, you know, directly chase away smaller species, for example, so that they are not competing for the same resources directly. So that's interference competition. That there, there's a direct interference uh, of one species interfering with the uh, with the other. In exploitation competition, these these two species might not ever meet. They might not ever have any aggression between them. So, uh, but they're feeding on the same resource. So, for example, uh, uh, you know, fig trees in the daytime are fed on by barbets and pigeons and so on. In the night, they're fed on by bats. Now, if uh, the, in the morning there's a lot of foraging happening, uh, the number of figs comes down and it's, there's not that much uh, resource available for the bats. The bats and the barbets are never going to meet, but they're never going to interact. But because they're feeding on the same resource, if one feeds the, uh, depletes resources, it is going to affect the fitness of the other, even though they never meet. So that is exploitation competition. It's also called scramble competition, which is uh, uh, the exploitation of a common resource. Okay, so this other question is about uh, transect study. And uh, while doing transect, is it not difficult to actually count birds, like come, with, come to a particular number? And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, wouldn't then uh, counting give us a valid uh, or valid non bias uh, would it give us a valid non biased data when the counting itself is so tough and cumbersome without right. missing, yeah. um you know it takes a lot of practice it's it's not easy when you start uh, doing these things uh, it takes a lot of practice to be able to quickly calculate or uh, you know uh, use the compass and the range finder to get at uh, uh, these uh, values but it's not impossible and the the whole point of doing this is to estimate uh, how many birds you're missing right so for example if uh, if it's ground birds and you know that uh, you know ground birds are difficult to see then the probability of detection of these ground birds is going to be low correct so you so you know so the fact that you might miss birds because there are too many birds in the habitat and you know all of this is happening at the same time is also accounted for by that detection probability process so uh, the birds that are really tough to see in the forests will have a low detection probability and the birds that are easy to see in the forest will have a high detection probability. So we don't calculate the detection probability for all birds, bird species together. You ideally want a separate detection probability for each species because the behavior of each species and the uh, ability to see or hear each species differs from, from species to species. Um, so even if you miss birds because there are too many, if you have enough data, you will be able to estimate how many birds you have missed. Uh, Jobin, I'll just take that follow-up question there, which is yeah. that in the given patch of forest, one draws the transect line and then counts the birds in the ESWs. How does one cover patches of forest that do not cover the assumed rectangular patch and will not be the exact dimensions of the ESWs? Patch web, right. So we are not, we don't know what the ESW is when we're doing a transect. We're walking along a transect. You don't know what the effective strip width is. This is not something that we know beforehand. Uh, the effective strip width is calculated or estimated after we come back and analyze the data. So birds are being counted both within what will ultimately be the effective strip width and outside the effective strip width. It is the rate at which detection declines with distance from the transect. 
that gives you the effect of strip quit. That can vary from transect to transect. It can vary from species to species. It can vary from habitat to habitat. It can vary from season to season. So the effect of strip quit is a variable measure. We don't know what that measure is. It comes, it's estimated from uh, the relationship between uh, distance from the transect and uh, detection probability. Okay. Um... Okay, so the next question is, is in a census counting, are teams given uh, multiple patches of, say, a rectangular forest, and then the sum total of all the counts become the total estimated population for a given species? Yes, that's that's one way to do a census where uh, you split up, uh, you divide the habitat that you're trying to sample, uh, that you're trying to census, in this case, forest, you divide that up into, you know, uh, uh, blocks or rectangular, rectangular, uh, you know, sections, and then each team is assigned one section, and then you know they come back and total up the numbers, and that's how you get a. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So the next question is: uh, Do uh, scientists also use combination of line transect and point count, point count, to get a total estimate, like a combination? So um, you can't. Analytically, you can't combine lines and points. When you come back and do the analysis, you cannot combine lines and points. Uh, what you could do is to sample the same habitat using line transit and, and using point counts, but the data that you get will have to be handled separately. Uh, and the estimates that you get will be separate for point counts and line transit. So it's, it's not possible to combine both of them into one uh, analytical framework. All right. Uh, so the next question is about how to uh, estimate populations uh, when in water bodies, like basically for water birds, uh, because uh, it has to be, I mean, does it have to be point count because uh, we cannot seem to do a transect study uh, in water bodies? And also, how do we count mixed flocks? Like, how do we estimate population of mixed flocks? So you know, water birds typically are censored by direct counts, you know, uh, because the body of water is open, you can stand on the shore with a with a scope, and you can actually count the number of birds that are there on that body of water. Uh, and you're unlikely to miss uh, species because there's not much vegetation in, in that uh, area. Of course, it depends on the skill of the person who's doing this and so on. It takes practice to get accurate counts uh from uh, direct counts of ducks and so on uh, but that's the typical way in which uh, these are uh, counted now if you have a water body that has vegetation on it let's say you know and the vegetation could hide species uh like in a forest you can actually do a tra line transit from a boat and uh, you know line transits have been used to uh, in in water to estimate densities of things like uh, you know uh, whales and dolphins and so on and the same principle can be applied uh, to, uh, to to birds uh, to water birds. So you can actually take a boat and you know go in a straight line through the water body and count birds on both sides and count the distances to this, uh, to these birds on both sides and actually use line transit methodology and line transit analysis to get at uh, population sizes or population densities of birds uh, you know, in uh, uh, in water. So if the birds in the water are swimming around, uh, how do we count them? Of course, yes, that the uh, assumption of the line transit, of course, is that uh, the speed at which the observer is moving is much faster than the speed at which the birds are moving. So if the birds are swimming around really fast and the boat is going at a very slow speed, then the line transit methodology is not appropriate. Uh, it's, it's just not the way to, do, to count uh, fast-moving uh, species, uh, how do we count mixed flocks? So when you're walking along a line transect, what we do when we encounter a flock is to take the distance to the center of the flock uh, and note it down as a mixed species flock. And you got, you know, seven species. Uh, they were all foraging, you know, 20 meters away uh, at an angle of uh, 20 degrees. And uh, all of them will get the same bearing and the same distance. You're taking the bearing, uh, the bearing and the distance to the center of, of the mixed flock. Uh, 
Deepika's so question is how do you avoid duplicate counting of the same individuals as birds keep flying around? So Deepika, like I was saying, you know, the line transect methodology is only going to work in a situation where the uh, the uh, birds are moving relatively slower than the observer on the line transect. The other thing to consider when you're doing line transects is that obviously you're not going to do only one line in a habitat, you're going to do multiple lines uh, in a habitat and you have to make sure that the distance between the lines is a minimum distance such that the same bird cannot be counted from both lines. So when you're doing a line transect uh, study, you can't have the home range of one bird overlapping two lines because then you're going to count the bird here and you're going to count the bird here. So that's a double counting. So the birds have to be moving relatively slowly while you're walking the line and the next line that you're sampling should be far enough that the same bird is not counted on both the lines. Now, obviously that distance is going to vary from uh, species to species, right? Some species are going to have very large home ranges. So if you're counting, uh, you know, something like, uh, uh, you know, eagles, you know, I'm just giving you an example here. You know, nobody really counts eagles using line transects. But if you uh, if you're counting a sp uh, species that has very large home ranges, then the transects also have to be placed very far apart. If you have a, if you're counting a species that has a small home range, then the transects can be placed relatively closer to each other. So it depends on on all of these considerations uh, to avoid uh, uh, double counting. Amit, uh, sorry, Sharda. Sharda. As a question for a large flock of birds, how is counting done since one can't count all? So you can't count all for a large flock of birds. Um, and you're going to miss some. I so it again, you know, these. The, the large flock of birds could be water birds on a water body. It could be, you know, rosy starlings in a in a grassland or an agricultural habitat. Uh, and the, and the methods to count these are going to vary. So, you know, for example, starlings or miners are large birds that have large flocks, and they come back to roost in the same location every day. So, in that case, you would do a roost count. Uh, in the case of water birds, you might do a direct count. So it's going to vary with uh, from species to species. Uh, the precise method that you use to count the number of individuals in the flock is going to differ. Uh, Amit Shankar has a question. Is the documentation and methodology available on bird count available online? Or can this documentation process be shared, please? This is all available online. Uh, there is, uh, I'm just going to type this into the chat box. There is a website called Pydot.org, which uh, deals with the market capture uh, methodology. There's a manual that you can download online for free, and it explains the whole market capture methodology very nicely. The line transect methodology also is available online. Uh, you can find that. I'll just paste the link here. Uh, you can find that in. Here, here is one uh, way to do one place where you can find this information. But but a lot of this information is completely free and available online. If you just Google ways, you know, line transit methodology, or you Google capture market capture, you'll be able to find this. Uh, 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 during which season, Anupita has a question asking: During which season are birds counted? How frequently are they counted per year? Uh, that depends on the kind of study that you're interested in doing. Uh, this will vary from study to study. Uh, so if you're interested in looking at breeding bird densities, you would count them in the breeding season. If you're interested in looking at wintering bird densities, you would count them in the winter. Uh, how frequently are they counted? That again depends on uh, what you're trying to do with your study. So it's, it's variable from study to study. So if I just want to monitor how breeding bird populations are changing from year to year, then I will you know, go out and measure only breeding bird populations year after year. Uh, if I'm interested in looking at, for example, survival of birds between summer and winter, 
and the survival of birds between the winter to summer, then I will sample in summer, I will sample in winter, I will sample the next summer and the next winter. So, so twice a year. So it depends really on the kind of question uh, question that you're interested in. You, you might even ask, uh, what is the day-to-day -day variation in the densities of species? That would mean you would actually go out and measure these things. You could actually go out and measure these things every day. Uh, so it depends on what kind of uh, 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 study that uh, you are conducting. There's no hard and fast rule uh, for when birds uh, should be counted. How do we calculate the home range of a species? Does it vary depending on the habitat for the same species? So calculating the home range of a species is uh, quite difficult, uh, especially for small birds, because the ideal way in which home ranges are calculated is where you fit, uh, you know, a radio transmitter or a GPS tag onto an animal, and you get, uh, you know, records of the locations where this animal was, and then those locations are then used to calculate the home range of uh, of the bird or of an animal. So you know we you know this has been done for animals like elephants and tigers and deer and so on, uh, which are large and which can actually carry these uh, these collars or tags. With birds, this has been done for larger raptors like eagles and vultures and condors. Uh, you know, fitting uh, a GPS or a satellite tag onto the back of backs of these uh, birds to figure out what the habitat range of the species is for smaller passerines the problem is that they're too small to carry a tag so estimating home ranges of these uh, birds is is more difficult one of the ways in which it has been done in the past is spot mapping uh, but again spot mapping can provide unreliable results if all the assumptions of spot mapping are not met uh, habitats home range size does vary for the same species from habitat to habitat so if you it often depends, for example, on the distribution of resources. So if you have a habitat where there are lots of resources, the density of resources is high, then an individual needs a much smaller area to be able to satisfy its energy requirements. Whereas in, in another habitat where the resources are less dense, they're more sparse, the amount of uh, resources that need to be gathered to satisfy energy requirements will have to come from a larger area. So it does depend on habitat to habitat uh, through the uh, distribution of resources, what exactly the home range size of this uh, species would be. Uh, Krishna has another question. So this is about point counts. So as bird count will be lower in a 10 meter radius, what is the optimum radius to be chosen for point count? Is there some method based on the density of land cover, like in a forest or grassland based on the visibility or accepted norm? based on vision maximum birds can be located with minimum error. So, uh, again, you know, in the classical point count method, you're not actually counting birds within a certain radius. You're not setting any particular radius within which birds have to be counted. What you're doing is you're measuring the radial distance to every bird, and then you're coming back and calculating the effective radial distance. So there is no hard and fast set rule for distance sampling based on a line transect or a point count within which you know within this distance is how i'm going to count birds now of course if you have a fixed radius point count then it depends uh, from habitat to habitat it depends from species to species so for instance in forest uh, it would depend on uh, for example if i i would have to have some very clear reason to say let's say that all birds within 50 meters of myself i'm not going to miss now that distance might extend to 100 meters in a grassland because visibility is higher so it, it in a fixed radius point count or a belt transect which is a fixed width line transect the distance within which you assume that no birds have been missed uh, by the observer depends on visibility in a habitat it depends on what kind of species we're talking about is the species very vocal is the species very uh you know uh spectacular easy to see easy to hear then the effective then the you know radial width might be higher if the species is very cryptic and you're likely to detect it only very very close to you then that radius has to become smaller because you're not likely to detect that species beyond a certain distance uh, so there's no industry standard or accepted norm it varies from uh, species to species varies from habitat to habitat uh, Point count is actually with, usually used uh, with binoculars. Uh, 
Anand, let me just take Anand's question is using the sampling count and since birds are mobile, is there not a chance of recording sagging the same bird multiple times? I think uh, we've already gone over this. Uh, line transect or point count methodology is only appropriate for birds that are uh, relatively slow moving compared to the observer. And two, the distance between the lines and the distance between the points has to be minimum such that you're not double counting, you're not counting the same individuals on neighboring lines or neighboring points. So the uh, distance between the point counts, or uh, the distance between the line transects has to be enough that the home range of one individual does not overlap two lines or two points. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's important for uh, line uh, Can the camera uh, be, can the camera be used? Uh, camera image be added usually you know it, i am familiar with forests and doing line dances and point guns in forests usually you know when you go to the forest there's quite a lot happening and uh, if you're actually doing a proper line transits or a proper point count uh, we usually don't do any photography and that's because uh, while doing photography you might miss while taking photographs you might miss individuals of, of species and we don't want ideally don't want to miss uh, as many, as much as possible, we want to have detection probability as high as possible, so that our estimates of abundance are are better. You know, the lower uh, the detection probability, the lower uh, the confidence we have in the estimates of density, species density, or species abundance. So, you know, when you're taking photographs, you're going to miss other individuals uh, in the habitat. So, I I, I at least have never. Uh, use the camera on a line transit or a point cloud. So, Jobin, are there any other questions? Uh, no, I mean, uh, I think we have covered the discussion forum questions and the questions on the chat box as well. Great. So, yeah. Then, uh, yeah. thank, well, thank, you. thank you very much for joining. I hope uh, I hope you enjoyed those uh, sessions on. Uh, estimating bird populations and uh, you know measuring bird populations and communities thank you yeah thanks umesh thanks priti thank for a great session and thanks everyone for joining in thanks a lot thank you bye